Hello and welcome back to part two of my big overview and comparison of Synology's DSM platform versus that of QNAP's QTS platform. This is part two in this series and today I'm going to talk about advanced storage. So we've already talked about initialization and setting up your pools and stuff. Now we want to see how these two big brands compare about the more advanced storage and in today's video we're going to be covering uh, standard file management then we're going to be going for searching throughout the whole system the ways in which you can do it then we're going to be looking at mapped drives and iSCSI targets how to set one up and how uh, you, they are configured on both of these systems then we'll be dipping into ssd management on these devices what options are out there what services you can use and setting up cache and you know the extent to which you can configure that uh, cache and finally we'll be looking at storage drive management adding a drive the options open to you with external drive expanding your raid and more but before we go any further you may have noticed i am not on screen right now yes on my previous video i was there at the bottom of the screen now the reason for this is no shyness but the graphical drive as you can see there in obs is going absolutely bananas and i couldn't get it sorted by the end of this recording so i am here and i apologize for not being there on camera to kind of direct this through um that you face to face but don't think i'm just shying away from the camera it is mainly that i could not get the graphic driver for that webcam to stop malfunctioning so i thought i'm just going to plow on with dsm here on the left and on the right hand side qts now we're going to be using multiple nasas in this video we're looking at the ds723 and the ds923 i've configured them in slight different ways uh things like uh, will become clearer later in the video the same goes the QNAP on the right, I'm using the TS-462 and the TS-264 here. So again, this is so I can show off different storage techniques without it impinging other ones. But let's crack on with our first area there, the file manager. So both of these systems arrive with an in-browser uh, kind of file management experience there. So if you want to go through the data in the window of uh, your web browser or even the mobile applications of course there are desktop and client applications for both Synology and QNAP and much like if you were using Windows Explorer that allows you to sort of browse through different files and folders you have the option to do that here it's very straightforward and again doing this via the web browser obviously it's not ideal because most users are going to want to use their own native OS or use, you know, file management on the client device they're using. But it's still very, very useful when you're remote connecting to your NAS to be able to go through the kind of files and folder structure. Now, it's worth also highlighting that Synology does have Synology Drive. Uh, again, I will be covering that in part three or four of this video where I'll be talking about Synology Drive because that is kind of Synology's premium way to file folder manage uh, either via the web browser via a single portal as well as all of the local synchronized uh, benefits as well and QNAP have um, Q, uh, uh, QSync uh, for them so again although that's not a file folder manager that does give you uh, the synchronization with your local native OS but I'm not going to be covering them in this video because I think those are more for the synchronization uh, part in this series but when it comes to the actual file station application for both these platforms, they're largely the same. You've got the sort of options you might be used to having. So on both of these, if we make our way into the multimedia area of both of them, where I've put uh, kind of Plex data and stuff like that within both of these, it's all largely the same if we look at the test files within both of these. What you can see, you can configure things quite a lot. You can go ahead and change the size of the icons you're seeing. I will say that the responsiveness does seem just a little bit better on the Synology. And I say a little bit, because although it does seem like it's a lot better from what you're seeing here, do bear in mind these aren't uh, systems in parity. This, uh, although they're both using uh, the ones you can see on screen here, dual core processors, this is using a dual core Intel uh, Celeron and this is that dual core AMD embedded Ryzen so when it comes to file management and responsiveness it's just going to be that little bit nippier but even if they were using the same CPU uh, DSM's file station will be just a little bit nippier but that said I would say the configuration options are a little better on the uh, QNAP there so for example if we go for beauty of Taiwan there the number of options that are open if we do the same on this side very similar. I'd say they're a little clearer there on the Synology if we zoom in just a little bit. 
on both of these. Uh, the configuration, as you can imagine, there's the whole compressing it, you know, putting it in a zip and stuff like that. Find a bit more information, let's see what both of these systems provide us when we request more information. So again, you can find out more about the permissions that have been granted and whether you want to change them on the fly. Um, Again, a little bit more analytical checkbox system there on the QNAP. And again, calculation of the size. Both of them allow you to find out more information about how much data is being taken. Uh, from this, you can also find out more about the access log of who and when has accessed it in the QLog Center on the QNAP. But again, that's going to be that little bit more uh, uh, kind of higher end information load that's going to be thrown at you there. Some of you may not take advantage of that, but still, some of you may appreciate it having it there. And again, Kind of copy and pasting is largely what you would expect so if you want to like garner two files there right click you can copy and move direct or just go on the fly it's all fairly standard stuff between the two of them it's presented i would argue with a little bit more polish on the synology side but on the qnap side there i would say that the uh, range of things you can bolt on and more on this in the synchronization video there's a greater degree of adding stuff on in terms of flexibility of what you can do there compared with that the Synology platform. But again, that's more for that sync platform. But for now, let's move on to searching for files and folders on this system. Now, when I say searching these individual NAS systems, what I mean by that is, is sometimes the, the, the kind of stuff you're searching for and the deepness that you want to search the system is going to vary. And both of these have a kind of multi-tiered um, level of searching the system so even basic stuff like say you wanted to search for a, a specific application both of them have got that option where you can just type in and find individual uh, tools and services that you might be looking for there and it will kind of go through the things that you've got to search for nice and easily the next tier up from that of course is going to be file folder or settings and options so both of them have got a little spy glass on their individual screens that allow you to search the system i would argue at least on this level the synology one is better so for example if i look for uh, 4k trailer i know for a fact that there's 4k trailers on the system and it's found those individual files and folders there and in the case of the qnap if i look for 4k trailer click start as you can see it's not finding that but if i was looking for example for a specific setting say i was looking for uh licensing then it will find apps and services. So this search here does not dig deep enough into that surface level to find a file or folder. But then both of them do have the next step up. In the case of the Synology, we can go for the universal search, which is effectively an extension of what we'll be using already. And in the case of the QNAP, this is where we would use the application known as QSearch. Now, QSearch, I would argue, is uh, probably the more detailed tool but it's also the more detailed tool that you may not need to use. It's also uh, to be used in conjunction with QFiling there, as you can see. So if we go back into QSearch there, you'll see what I mean. So, for example, in the universal search, we will be able to find, let's go for uh, the Matrix. We know the Matrix is on there. We've got a copy of the movie. There is the matrix there. There's our file folder. That's where it's based. There's even the installation guide that was an FLV shortcut that I created for an installation a few years ago, which I've stored on this device. We can then right click. We can choose to open in file station. We can download the file directly from here, or we can open it in a brand new window, or if it's a multimedia file, we can play it. Now, again, this is for another video, but if you have installed the Synology Office application, it will allow you to open up apps and services such as PDFs and docs within your window. And the same goes for the QNAP. If you've installed the Windows Office plugin, you can then open up, you know, Microsoft Word, uh, uh, spreadsheets, that sort of thing, all within the window. From here, you can choose, if you wish, to uh, kind of open those up in individual windows. You can change the search settings. Again, indexing will have to be done periodically but apart from that that's really all you have there it is search with a few bells and whistles now q search i would argue could do with a slight improvement in its design it's another case of qnap um having quite mixed messages with designs across different apps there isn't really a single house style and it does look a little bit dated a little bit old style search engine but at the same time i really like its capabilities so this time we'll look up the word matrix 
it will search the whole system and as you can see it's found that matrix movie it's found two of the things that we had over there it just didn't happen to have all of them but again if you want to create thumbnail generation you can enable that but of course we use more resources in order to do it so we're going to enable that now but you do have that option now again we are looking at this in a squished screen screen format so it's probably not helping but at the same time from here not only have you got the options to add quite bespoke filters which again you do have slight filter rules here but not really uh, the same level but on top of that when we right click we've got the option to share those files directly which from here we didn't have so again you can share those files automatically via the multitude of means and again you can have all those preset parameters as well as opening them in a not dissimilar way to what you saw earlier on but QNAP goes just a little extra higher level more than that when you want to utilize something known as Q filing. Now we saw it earlier on, but ultimately Q filing is a tool that allows you to very quickly move bulk files within your system to different um, areas. And again, but depending on the license you go for, and yes, we will talk about licenses later on, you can enable different kinds of service as well. So once you've found groupings of files, if they're video, you can transload them on the fly. You can encrypt them if you choose in encrypted folders, compress them, watermark them if they're images, resize them uh, to different formats. If you're using quite heavy PNGs for blogs and more, you'll know about that. Again, there's lots of services there, and some of these are AI linked, I will add. However, again, these are license-led. So, for example, within QFiling, independent of QSearch, what you can do is create a new filing task. That new filing task will allow you, for example, to find, you search a certain directory. So, in my case, if I want to find all those multimedia files, I can go into the multimedia folder here. Or, moreover, I can go into that share or the public one, wherever it was. So, we'll go for that. We'll go the public. We'll use that one there create next we ought to run it now but of course we can do real-time tasks or overtime tasks or schedule tasks from here we can then set certain rules and from these rules i can then say what i want the the filter to be so if i want it to be a certain kind of png i can choose that i want it to be a certain kind of file any file any photo that was done within uh the uh before this date so anything before this year I can then say for that ruling, I now want them to now do these actions. So if I want to make sure that certain photos before a certain date are all having their faces blurred, are all being watermarked to a certain point, I can go ahead and do that. And again, enable that watermark being text-based or an image watermark. And again, after you've done that filing there, you can say where you want them to be sent within your NAS. From there, once you selected a destination, I'm not going to too much detail, you can say how you want it structured. So do you want uh, results in individual structures? Do you want individual files and folders to be separated on certain parameters like dates or sizes or age and more? And finally, how you want destination file handling. So exceptions to the rule. All of that can be set up. So by creating this incredibly detailed um uh, ruling there and again I've not enabled any hence that error there you can then set up coming out of it there because it would take ages the ability for your NAS to cycle through terabytes of data and perform these actions on mass throughout the system but of course there is licensing you can perform uh, one task um, eight times and again you can you've got limited light access at the beginning so if you're a home user and want to use this ad hoc that's great but if you're a business user with constant growing data there is a license something that throughout this series you're going to hear a lot about the QNAP you get a lot of features but a lot of them you get a little bit of a taste and then you have to go premium with licensing something I know a lot of you are not going to be overly keen on same goes for that Q search as you can see, the depth of that searching uh, is slightly hobbled by that premium licensing. And again, we've talked about that before. I could talk about the cost of licensing on here. It's not that much uh, on a per user, per device basis, but depending on the scale of your setup, it will add up. But when it comes to searching the system, I would still say that the Synology one looks nicer, is a little bit more responsive, but the QNAP one, although a little dated in its look and has that license hobbling in places, is a far more capable search tool when it comes to the baseline level 
of your system. But for now, let's make our way into storage within the system. Next up, I want to talk about storage and its health. I touched on very briefly in a previous video about how uh, within the storage manager, you can check on drive health with things like smart testing and more. What if it's really quite you know, critical to you and your business that that data remains integrally safe? And moreover, that the drives, if they show the nearest hint of an issue, that either reparations can be made immediately or that you are kept aware of even the smallest imbalance. Now, within that field, both of the NAS brands I've got here go about it a slightly different way. Now, both of them do have kind of premium subscription services that allow you to monitor the device and its storage from afar, although arguably they have gone about it a slightly different way. Now, again, towards the end of the video, I'm going to talk about things like um, hot spares and raid rebuilding and raid expansions and, you know, raid recoveries and such. But for now, I just want to talk about two main tools. In the case of the QNAP, I want to talk about a tool called Drive Analyzer. Now, Drive Analyzer arrives in the form of an app that you can install on the NAS uh, and the application you will need to connect to uh, the remote services because it is running uh, as an um, external service. And what it does, once you have synchronized it with your system, and again, I've not done a full video on this platform since I did the uh, beta for it, since it came out of beta, so I will be returning to this. But what it does is connect with this external platform to monitor your drives. So for example, once you've synchronized it, again, you get, I believe, one drive monitoring for free. Then on top of that, it allows you to monitor individual drives within your system and then uh, predicted lifespans of the drives or just continued monitoring will let you know if a drive is potentially going to fail and recommended actions for that. Because a lot of the time what you see when you're looking at these storage managers for these systems is they're letting you know when you know temperatures are a bit wobbly or they're letting you know that a drive may have had slight bad block sectors but it doesn't really act upon that and the way it informs you is very two-dimensional and that's where you get these premium level services that not only allow you to bulk monitor many 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 drives but also many many individual NAS systems and although DA drive analyzer has been out of beta for a while now it's actually been around on beta for a good couple of years uh, and lots of stuff to do with how how you're alerted within that online platform and kind of tailored um, uh, uh, performance reports are available within there and the extension of the system is actually pretty darn good and it allows you to have that single portal access point monitoring all of these but also comparable data to run this against something that's uh, kind of not available in the primary storage when you're monitoring the smart and stuff when all you've really got is the system itself to weigh, uh, lay comparison against. And it's the idea of having predictions based on all this analytical information on the lifespan of those drives. Now, on the Synology platform, they respond in two different ways to that. One of them is a completely free way, and another one of them is uh, the premium way. So the uh, free way is known as Storage Analyzer. So if we switch to our other NAS, and the Storage Analyzer will periodically scan your system, and it will check the data on there, and it will go through how the data's been shared, what's been accessed, and you know comparable versions of uh, reports are available on your system. There's even, of course, the QLog Center that we talked about that will produce reports based on activity on your system, but it's not really um, specific to storage. That's more kind of system-wide. Uh, they do have, of course, the SSD profiling tool, and again, this is to give you uh, analysis over time of the SSDs in your system and the most optimal way to use them but again that's a lot more ssd optimized and again you can produce kind of minor reports of sorts within the storage manager of the qnap but it's not quite as intuitive or presented as well as the storage analyzer so creating a, a report is really really straightforward you give it a name so we'll call it test one from there add an email but of course you will have to enable external access uh, for email notifications from your Synology account if you do that. How or when you want it to run, what schedule, the number of reports to be kept over time. From there, what you want monitored by this report within the storage. From there, do you want specific areas monitored or the whole thing? Um, what you want to happen with duplicate files, do you want that mentioned in the report if there's duplicate file names to you know stop you having doubled up data and that's it, you can even generate a report immediately. 
Now, what do those reports look like? Well, let me show you. If we open one up, we can have a look at it there. You can see what it looks like there on screen where it's broken down into the storage quota, file types more, what's been used, however. Also get that PDF report version that you can download as individual CSVs. It's, you know, it's quite informative. And remember, that's free and included. So fair play to them for including that option. The premium option, of course, some of you may already be aware of, is known as Active Insight. Active Insight is kind of a bulk Synology management tool. It doesn't just look at storage, it looks at system health, of course, and more. And again, that will, when we cover lots more information in CMS, uh, uh, central management systems, and content management systems later on, uh, we'll maybe dip into this again. But Active Insight is kind of this overarching uh, tool that you can use for free on a trial, so you don't get any free licenses after a month. But for, um, they're saying 23.99 euros, again, call it 20 to 25 of your local currency. Uh, it'll allow you to monitor that device and add it. And again, from there, you can add more systems. And again, we do have the trial version, uh, the demo, I should say, that allows you to, for example, see this large hosted array of different devices here we can dig in. So for example, let's monitor this RS3617XS. So if we go into this system here, check out the hardware utilization and we can dip into that uh, storage utilization as well and again you can configure customized reports if you choose and again all of this will be within that premium package and a lot of these reports they are um, a, a lot more uh, I would say uh, uh, attractive to the eye uh, than the ones that we've seen before so if we go ahead and view that we can open that up there it's going to be zipped up so we want to open that file but from there, you've got that activity log. You can dig all the way in, and all of those are individual reports within that big report. So I would argue, again, Synology have kind of won this one in terms of the presentation of it, not just that free report tool there, where you can get most bits of this reporting tool on the QNAP, but they're spread across individual applications and services. Again, within the resource monitor, you can produce a report, but it's still not as detailed or as polished as this I just overall I think although all of the details and the management are available on the QNAP platform they're presented better on the Synology but just do bear in mind about that more premium platform active insight there and you know what it gives you which isn't available on that storage analyzer but for now let's move over to um, access from the outside let's talk about map drives and iSCSI connections and your native OS and how this storage appears and can be linked now I briefly covered map network drives in the first part of this series when I was mentioning about utilizing the client tools for QNAP and Synology that you can download on your desktop, there was the option to find a NAS that you want to connect with. Then from there, you would right click, you can select uh, network drives, and then from there, you can start connecting to your NAS. Again, I've already logged in, but it will ask me to log in once again. So I can go ahead and log in here with the QNAP. And from there, go ahead and it will list all of those drives. These are the drives that inside that um, QNAP NAS system are the shared folders there that we created earlier on. And again, in part one, I did go about how these two brands approach creating shared folders, and they're all there. So this allows you, if you choose, to just right-click on any one of these individual folders, right-click, so we'll go for that home folder there, and then we map that network drive. It will be slightly different on map, on Mac even. Just give it a letter, go for the letter I, click Finish, and then as you can see, here on my list of drives on my Windows machine. I've got my usual drives here at the top and we'll talk about these two in a bit, but now we've added that drive there and it allows me to communicate with that NAS and just dump data into it and communicate with it on my local OS file manager, my operating system, in this case Windows, instead of using that file manager within the QNAP. Again, on the Synology side, if we choose, let's close that, much the same, right click, map network drive, Again, if we've already authenticated, which I've already done, I can reuse those credentials, or I can use a different credential if I choose. Connection is exactly the same, and once I've connected it all the way through, I'll be able to find, as you can see, I've already connected uh, the volume and multimedia, uh, multimedia and virtual images here, and then, as you can see, open it up there, 
and there is exactly the same folder there seen within the Synology and here on my local OS. Now, as good as that will sound, I will highlight that there are a number of applications, and particularly you guys that are using a NAS for uh, photo video editing, there are some tools that will not communicate with mapped network drives. They don't like communicating with mapped network drives. They consider them external. Also, it can lessen the performance if you're connecting on 10 GBE. Map network drives don't really work as smoothly. And for those users, that's when iSCSI rears in. So let's go ahead and disconnect those. We're just going to let this do it in its background. And while it does that, as you can already see, I've already got the QNAP and the Synology here connected on this device. So I've already connected them thanks to something called iSCSI uh, targets and LUNs. Now, if you work in the higher end business sector, you'll know what these are. But for the rest of you, all it is is a block of storage that although it exists within the NAS and it does give you the ability in some cases to communicate with some of those storage areas using uh, primary tools, this is creating a block or blob or bucket of storage that you bolt on to your local operating system with the appearance of local. Now, that is a huge oversimplification, but that's really it. And what I've done, as you can see here already, is I've created 250 gig here on the Synology and 250 gig here on the QNAP with both of these. And don't worry, I will walk you through the LUN process shortly to give you guys an understanding of how these two differ. But both of these allow me to use a tool known as an uh, an iSCSI initiator. So let's bring the iSCSI initiator again. It does differ if you are an, an, an Apple user. But an iSCSI initiator is kind of the bridging tool between your local communication uh, PC and that of uh, a remote access target there. So as you can see, they're there. It's connected. I've got lots of old ones from ones I've used before, but we will be coming back to that tool in just a moment. So for now, let's go ahead and connect our brand new um, iSCSI target and um, uh, LUN. So the LUN is the storage. So first thing first, we'll create our new target. So let's go with both of these to create our target. So as you can see straight away, it's uh, on there side by side. We'll go for create there. So again, we'll call this one target two, or actually even better, we're going to call this sin target two. In the case of the QNAP there, we'll go click next. For that, we're going to call this one uh, QNAP target, oh no, we can't use spaces, target two. Again, it's got the target alias there, and we've got advanced settings there. Chap is effectively an authentication, kind of a, an extra layer of access if you want. It's going to be support. That's quite a generic um, extra in there, but it's still quite useful. Go to the next screen. Next, it's asking us, do we want to create a LUN on the Synology? Remember, the LUN is the storage. So if we want, we can create ourselves a brand new LUN on the Synology. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to call this one Syn LUN 2. We're going to give that one uh, 300. Uh, of storage and again we can select the different provisionings there we've got two options moving back over to the QNAP we can see again that chap authentication it's now asked us we can say no and then we can choose if we wish at the bottom to create a LUN and map it to this target something we're going to do so now we see how the QNAP approaches LUN creation we have to select the volume much like you can see there selecting the volume we can choose whether we want that thick or uh, thin provisioning there and again for both of these I'm going to go thick but don't worry we're not going to go into too much detail on that one if you have multiple pools you can select between them so on the QNAP next up we've got its um, name there we're going to call that target 22 we're going to give it the storage area so again we're going to go for 300 gig of storage there Again, we've got more idea of the overall storage available on the system on the QNAP. And again, we can go to advanced settings there. We can change the sector size if we choose. We can choose whether we want uh, write cache notifications there. And if we have SSD caching in place, we can utilize other uh, variable or uh, variable options there. And again, we can go ahead and now we can create that storage on the QNAP on the Synology side. Click next. And there we go. So we didn't get that extra option there but ultimately it's a very similar process between them. Once the SCSI is being created, so we're going to ignore the one and go back to the one that we have already know that we've created there already on both of these. Let's see what our configuration options are for both of them. Both of them allow snapshot, as you can see, with snapshot routines, whether it's being you want to do uh, periodic snapshots, tying it into your existing snapshot manager, or take a one-off snapshot if we choose. 
go back to the LANs. If we choose, we can change, uh, change the account control. Uh, on top of that, we can modify if we choose. So let's see on both of these if we can go ahead and how well we can modify the LAN. So again, we can change the capacity there on the fly. Again, provisioning will have made a difference whether we can do that. Uh, enabling or disabling uh, which LUN, uh, sorry, targets they can be found on. Uh, individual access permissions. So again, that's when you assign it to individual users. And caching, how you want caching um, attached to it, the level of IO. And it's quite interesting that these were not available during the setup of the Synology LUN. They're things that I've had to change afterwards. So there may be users out there that may never know they could have all the IO level to improve the performance there as well as some of the caching options on that LUN for the Synology whereas on the QNAP it's thrown those options at you at the beginning which you may or may not like and again you can modify the LUN in a number of ways but again largely most of them are the ones that we've already seen there so again all of those things as well as whether you want to uh, list the storage because now once we've created those LUNs you can view them within the storage so again once you go to the system, you can now see all the individual targeted LUNs and stuff within the QNAP Storage Manager. If we go to the Synology one and go into the Storage Manager there, as you can see, we can see the drives, we can see the storage pools, but we can't really see those LUNs that we've created. We can go into the volume and we can dig a little in, but it's quite surprising that we're not able to see the LUNs within that Storage Manager in that single portal on the Synology we can on the QNAP and some of you may enjoy having this other level of storage overview and again in the synchronization part of this series we will touch on just how many kinds of storage you can overview at once within the QNAP system there but again once you you know created those lines attaching them to your local system again we're not going to give any one advantage to either system but using an iSCSI initiator or the Mac equivalent will allow you to just quickly go ahead and attach these LUNs very easily by adding the IP of your system and I've already made a video on this allowing you to add these storage areas to your system and again once they're there they will appear on the available list of iSCSI targets there so again nice and easy and that allows you to very quickly add these storage areas to your system again i'm not going to walk you through iSCSI initiate that will add like another 10 to 15 minutes to this video to go through the stuff to do with that but moving forward now we're going to talk about how these two platforms deal with ssds this has been quite a hot topic and i think even though there's been changes to dsm this is something where qnap have done very well on in their support of ssds in qts over dsm now, both of these systems have got a combination of hard drives and SSDs inside. But as you can see, in the case of both of these systems, I have not initialized either of the M2 NVMEs in this system. Yes, you can use SATA-based SSDs in the main bays of these individual systems if you choose. You can go ahead, if you like, and install a SATA SSD inside either one of these systems to allow you to use them as storage pools. But of course, when it comes to M2 NVMEs, one of the hot topics when it's come the different between Synology and QNAP is what you can do with them. Now, recently, releases from Synology like the DS723 Plus and the DS923 Plus have allowed you to use M2 NVMEs for storage pools, not just caching. However, not only can you only use that feature on these two systems, so I'm not prepared to say, I hate seagulls, that this is a feature that's widely available on DSM at the time of recording. I will also say that the SSDs you can use on these systems only can only be you uh, you can only use M2 NVMEs as storage pools with Synology's own SSDs right now. So to put that into perspective, as you can see here with the DS923, when it comes to using hard drives, they've added Seagate to Shiba, uh, WD, loads of drives on there for those storage pools. But what if you want to use the M2 NVMEs? Well, if we search, currently you can only use their own SSDs. Now you can install third party SSDs in these bays for caching, but, when it comes to storage pools, at the time of recording, you can only use Synology SSDs, but more on that in just a moment. For now, let's go ahead and see what options are open to us when we want to kind of use one of these drives. So, there's our drive here. We can select the Manage Available Drives, and this allows us to choose what we want to do with our M2 NVMe. On the QNAP side here, if we select our M2 NVMe there, we've got the option for Action, 
which allows us to scan it, create a new volume on it and more. Or we can go ahead and go to the storage and snapshots area there to create a storage pool if we choose, create a new volume if we choose, or if we want to create caching with that drive, we have to select the caching option and then select plus. What's the point I'm making? Well, I'm not overly keen on the fact that if I don't know what I'm doing, creating storage pools, caching, all that stuff is being made quite layered here on the, on the QNAP here. I wish there was the really user-friendly natured bubble here of just saying, there's my drive in the system, now tell me what my options are to do with it. This QNAP seems to do it the other way around. And although there is a greater degree of configuration open to me, and there is, when you set it up for the first time, a setup wizard, which I'll show you now, which does allow you to use the setup wizard to tell you what to do. But again, that just leads me immediately into storage pool and that business of QTIR that we'll talk about, although I did touch on it in part one. Again, I just wish the QNAP gave me this wonderful one window that allowed me to choose what I want to do with that drive. So first thing we'll look at is caching. So for both of these, let's see what options it presents me with with caching. Immediately, things look more technical on the QNAP, but we'll get to that in a bit. So firstly, the Synology is asking me, what's the volume I want to attach this cache to? So <clears throat> if you don't know what cache is, nice and simple, caching comes invariably in two main forms. There's read caching, where data that lives on the main hard drives that is most frequently accessed is moved Oh, sorry, copied over to the SSD. So when that data is needed later on, it's retrieved a lot more quickly because SSDs are faster. But it only really benefits small files more on that later. And the benefits are more in terms of latency and responsiveness. Write caching is when data is sent to the NAS. It is written to the SSDs first and then in the background moved to the hard drives, thereby improving write to the system in terms of performance when you're uploading data. And then you can have combined read and write caching together, which allows you to then benefit from both of those, but you need two SSDs to do it. Now, why did I give you that long-winded reply? Well, because on the Synology, you can only use read-write caching or read-only caching. You can't have write-only caching. Now, write-only caching would benefit upload speeds. I would still recommend having at least two SSDs because if you have a system failure, the data would be written to the SSDs but not the hard drives, and you may lose data as data was not cached or stored appropriately during the write, because remember, it's some data is gonna be gradually written. Still, write caching with multiple drives isn't completely out of this world as far as something people want. And I've always been surprised that Synology have not embraced write caching, because when you go to the QNAP there, we can select our drive, and then from there, we can have read-only caching, read-write caching, or write-only caching. But of course, depending on the caching choice you choose, as you can see, it recommends using uh, two drives to recover. You can, if you choose, go ahead with one drive for your write caching or select two drives. And then if we like, we can go for read-write caching, which will create that RAID 1. Or if we wish, we can go for write-only caching as a RAID 0 or a RAID 1. There's a lot more configurable options there. Now, if we move forward, we'll go for read-write caching on both systems. As you can see, it's letting you know that with read-write caching, you're not allowed to just remove the drives without causing undue harm. Again, read-write caching insists upon a RAID 1, in, uh, RAID 1 environment because in a um, read-write caching, you need the two drives to work parallel to one another. Move forward. And then you can see the next thing. From here, we select our drives which we've already done on the QNAP, click Next. Then we say how uh, uh, the storage uh, ca capacity, if we want to use the whole drive space. And then that's it, that SSD cache on the Synology is ready to go. On the QNAP, we've still got a few more options. Let's zoom in on both of them. So on the QNAP, we can choose whether we want to enable SSD over provisioning. SSD over provisioning ultimately reduces the available storage space on an SSD, but at the same time uses that now reserved space on the SSD to enhance performance. 
Next, you can change the I.O. level, something we talked about earlier with the iSCSI, but allowing you to change the uh, effectively the size of each block within the cache to uh, benefit caching towards other means, not just the random I.O., which we mentioned earlier on with much smaller files, but larger caching volumes as well. And again, you can go straight ahead and change the block size yourself if you choose. And there you go. It's letting you know the SSD where you want to enable it, what you want to assign it to. So in the case of the uh, Synology, we are assigning the cache to a whole volume. Within the QNAP, I can choose whether I want it to be to preset individual SCSI LUNs we've created, uh, created or multiple volumes if we choose. And that's it. It's all ready to go. And if we chose we could go ahead and create our individual cache for both of these systems. And yes, you can configure the cache in uh, over time, but I would still argue that although the, uh, the creating cache on the Synology is very user-friendly and they've done great advancements in improving the benefits of cache within individual applications, I'd still argue the QNAP there, as far as SSD support, still continues to be the much more configurable tool, and particularly in terms of cache, more viable options. And if we were looking at a QUTS uh, platform or you know the ZFS QNAPs, we'd see even more caching benefits there thanks to ZFS, the ZBAT file system, having those advantages for you. And remember, earlier on, as mentioned, you do have the SSD profiling tool as well to allow the QNAP to learn over a certain period of test time the best configuration for your SSDs. And finally, as again mentioned earlier on, you can go ahead and choose to create uh, that uh, tiered, uh, that storage pool of Q-tier that allows you to combine hard drives and SSDs that will allow you to create one single storage area that instead of all of the storage caching, which is when data is copied to an area of the disk, the system learns in Q-tier where the most important data is and moves it to the appropriate area of the storage system. Again, similar to cache, but a different logic and definitely uh, when it comes to creating one large storage area that has inside hot, warm, and cold storage areas, very beneficial. Overall, in terms of SSD handling, the QNAP just gives you way, way more options, although it is obviously more user-friendly on the Synology. Let's go to our last area of this video, drive additions and RAID expansions. Now, I just added another drive to both of these NASs you can see here on screen. In the case of the Synology, I've added an additional Synology larger drive into the arrangement of drives there available on that 923. And in the case of the QNAP, that TS462, I've added an additional 14 TB drive into the arrangement of available drives. So it should take around about a minute or so, but we should see, and as you can see, both of these systems have now recognized I've added a new drive. So in the case of that Synology, drives that I've added there it's not going to allow me to add it until I've updated the firmware that beep there responds to the drive being added to the system to alert me that it is now available there as you can see it's added it so what are our options well it really does depend on the storage system you're using in the case of the Synology and again I could update the firmware on this drive but not only do I want to use the, for the this drive for a future video coming up soon about drive firmware updates, but also I'm not going to be adding this drive for this video because I need this NAS for other videos I'm filming later today and adding the drive would affect that performance. But it still allows me to show you some of the options that are open. So again, the in the case of the Synology, I've got that option for managing drives. So I can, if I've got an existing storage area, I can choose to change an existing RAID type there. So if I don't know if you guys remembered in the previous video, I mentioned one of the beautiful benefits of Synology is SHR. It allows you to add different capacity drives into a single RAID array. So say the uh, 10 TB drives that I'm currently using were starting to run out of space. A normal RAID would cap me at whatever the smallest drive is. So in a normal RAID, I would add the 16 TB. Remember it, don't worry about that 14.6. It's all about the maths of gigabytes versus megabytes versus terabytes. A normal RAID, if I tried to add that, or I tried to add more bigger drives, it would class all of them as the smallest drive. But in the case of an SHR, if I, if I add a larger drive, an SHR just needs to know what the largest drive capacity is, and then it makes redundancy for that amount. 
So if I add this one drive, it's not gonna make a huge amount of difference because it's the largest drive. But if I slowly replace each of those drives, each time with the RAID accepting this new drive, uh, in, have it in the new drive, it will allow me to mix and match these larger drives, something that's not available on the QNAP. On the QNAP, if I added a 16 TB drive to one of these bays, what would happen is, it would only see it as the smallest drive. And again, I've talked about SHR in other videos, but I do think, once again, it's worth highlighting. So again, if I go for this, I can choose, if I wish, to either add the drive as a storage expansion, I can ch um, and add it, uh, change the RAID type. So changing the RAID type will allow me to expand my SHR into an SHR2. That SHR2, as you see, it won't let me add the drive because of that firmware update but it effectively allows me to add that drive to that existing arrangement of drives. Alternatively, add it as a storage expansion, will allow me to add the drive to the existing array, thereby just keeping that SHR, but adding another drive. Once again, that firmware update is what's um, enabling, uh, stopping me from adding the drive. Finally, you've got replacing the drive. And this goes back to what I mentioned earlier on. If you want to slowly but surely change each of the drives inside your system, to uh, bigger drives. An SHR allows you to do that with those larger drives and allow you to replace drives one by one. Then, of course, there's adding it as a hot spare, which is when a drive exists outside of the array, and that drive outside of the array allows you, if we had that firmware on there, to, um, if one of these drives fails or starts showing negative impacts, rather than wait for you to swap the drive out in a RAID, a hot spare will allow the system to automatically start switching over to that new drive there. So again, lots of options open to you, or of course, create its own independent storage pool, of course, which again, you can put volumes on. So all the options are there, and they're all pretty straightforward. And again, I love that I can view all the options in that single window. Now, in the case of the QNAP, the options are relatively similar. So again, we can go to that drive there. We can go to RAID group, where that won't show us that drive. It'll only show us the existing RAID group. Again, if we choose, we can attach uh, to an existing storage pool from there. It's not quite as user-friendly, is it? On top of that, we can scan the drive if we choose, create a new volume if we choose, uh, basing uh, within the existing storage pool. And that's really about it. If we go into the storage and snapshots area, what we can do is from there, go ahead and create new storage areas. Or if we're highlighting an existing storage pool, click manage. And then from there, we're able, if we choose, to start utilizing this new drive. So from there, we can remove the pool and kill it. We don't wanna do that, but we can expand the pool. Or if we were using SSDs, upgrade the system to that Q tier we mentioned earlier on. So expanding the pool will allow us to add this drive. So as you can see, we can go ahead and either create a new group, add a, a, a disk to an existing group. So we can see, we'll go ahead, choose that existing group there, click next. Then we'd select our drive. From there, click next. And then when we're ready, we click expand. But bear in mind, if we'd done that, it would take quite a while to do that. Because these are uh, 14 TB drives, and this NAS is going to be used for other videos. Of course, we can do other things. We can start replacing disks, as mentioned earlier on. We can go ahead, if we choose, add the disk in the existing array. Migrate the RAID group into a new RAID configuration. All of those are options that we can do. But it's just worth remembering that if you don't know where all these options are, it doesn't quite feel as intuitive, does it? Whereas on the Synology, you can see they've spent a lot of time creating that nice intuitive array. But that's really it for a, a kind of uh, advanced storage options with you and your NAS for part two in this series of DSM versus QTS from Synology and QNAP respectively. In part three, I'm gonna be talking, talking about synchronization with other storage platforms. And in that video, I'm not only gonna be talking about the likes of Synology Dome C2 platform and hybrid mount, I'm of course gonna be talking about cloud synchronization, bolting on apps and services and more, as well as of course, Synology Drive. In the case of QNAP, of course, I'm gonna be looking at hybrid mount. I'm going to be looking at a lot of their own virtual tools there and synchronized tools with PAAS and SAAS services, everything down to the smaller app level stuff with WordPress servers and Google Photos, all the way through to larger ones with BoxSafe um, and more, all of them one by one, 
uh, on either of these systems side by side. Forgive me starting to lose my voice. I'm a little under the weather. But thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Let me know if you have. Click like if you enjoyed the video. Subscribe to learn more. Questions for other videos, put them in the comments. And there should be links to a full comparison and the playlist for this as each of these parts start to arrive. Thank you so much for watching. Free advice linked below if you want to use that. Plus links to buy on Amazon if you want to support the channel. And apart from that, I'll see you next time.